a caution about dispersing reminders of your actions. There's an obvious danger in putting reminders of things you need to do somewhere out of sight. The function of an organization system is primarily to supply the reminders you need to see when you need to see them, so you can trust your choices about what you're doing and what you're not doing. Before you leave the office for the day, the actionable emails that you still have pending must be reviewed individually, just like your calls or at computer lists. In essence, at action is an extension of your at computer list and should be handled in exactly the same fashion. Your paper-based pending workflow must likewise be assessed like a list if the paper materials are being used as your only reminders. Distributing action triggers in a folder, on lists, and or in an email system is perfectly okay as long as you review all of the categories to which you've entrusted your triggers equally as required. You don't want things lurking in the recesses of your systems and not being used for their intended purpose, reminding you. In order to hang out with friends or take a long, aimless walk and truly have nothing on your mind, you've got to know where all your actionable items are located, what they are, and that they will wait. And you need to be able to do that in a few seconds, not days. Organizing Project Reminders Creating and maintaining one list of all your projects, that is, again, every commitment or desired outcome that may require more than one action step to complete, can be a profound experience. You probably have more of them than you think. If you haven't done so already, I recommend that initially you make a projects list in a very simple format, similar to the ones you've used for your lists of actions. It can be a category in a digital organizer, a page in a loose leaf planner, or even a single file folder labeled projects with either a master list or separate sheets of paper for each one. The Projects Lists The Projects List is not meant to hold plans or details about your projects themselves, nor should you try to keep it arranged by priority or size or urgency. It's just a comprehensive index of your open loops. You actually won't be working off the projects list during your day-to-day -day activities. For the most part, your action lists and any ad hoc tasks that come up will constitute your tactical in-the-moment focus. Remember, you can't do a project. You can only do the action steps it requires. The real value of the projects list lies in the complete review it can provide at least once a week, allowing you to ensure that you have action steps defined for all of your projects and that nothing is slipping through the cracks. A quick glance at this list from time to time will enhance your underlying sense of control. You'll also know that you have an inventory available to you and to others whenever it seems advisable to evaluate workloads. One list or subdivided. Most people find that one list is the best way to go because it serves as a master inventory rather than as a daily prioritizing guideline. The organizing system merely provides placeholders for all of your open loops and options, so your mind can more easily make the necessary intuitive, moment-to-moment -moment strategic decisions. Frankly, it doesn't matter how many different lists of projects you have, so long as you look at the contents of all of them as often as you need to, since for the most part, you'll do that in one fell swoop during your weekly review. Some common ways to subsort projects. There are some situations in which it makes good sense to subsort a projects list. Let's look at these one by one. Personal, professional. Many people feel more comfortable seeing their list divided up between personal and professional projects. If you're among them, be advised that your personal list will need to be reviewed as judiciously as your professional one and not just saved for weekends. Many actions on personal things will need to be handled on weekdays exactly like everything else. And often some of the greatest pressures on professionals stem from the personal aspects of their lives that they are letting slip. Delegated projects. If you're a senior manager or executive, you probably have several projects that you are directly responsible for but have handed off to people who report to you. While you could, of course, put them on your waiting for list, it might make better sense to create a projects delegated list to track them. Your task will be simply to review the list regularly enough to ensure that everything on it is moving along appropriately. 
specific types of projects. Some professionals have as part of their work several different projects of the same type, which in some instances it may be valuable to group together as a sublist of projects. For example, I maintain a separate category called Projects to Deliver, a chronological listing of all the upcoming seminars, coaching, and consulting assignments I've committed to. These events are projects like the rest in that I need to keep noting whether things are moving along on and in place for them until they're completed. But I find it helpful to see them all organized on one list in the order in which they're coming up in my calendar, apart from my other projects. If you are a real estate agent, sell consulting services, or develop proposals for a relatively small number of prospective clients in any profession, you will likely find it useful to see all of your outstanding sales relationships in progress in one view. This could be a separate list in your planner called Client Projects in Development. Or, if you already have file folders for each in-progress project, it may suffice to group them all in one file stand on your credenza. Just realize that this approach will work only if it represents a complete set of all those situations that require action, and only if you review them regularly along with the rest of your projects, keeping them current and conscious. What about sub-projects? Some of your projects will likely have major sub-projects, each of which could, in theory, be seen as a whole project. If you're moving into a new house, for instance, and are upgrading and changing much of the property, you may have a list of actionable items like finalize landscaping, renovate kitchen, rewire basement, and so on, all of which could in themselves be considered separate projects. Do you make all of this one entry on your projects list? Say, finish new home renovations? Or do you write up each of the sub-projects as an individual line item? Actually, it won't matter, as long as you review all the components of the project as frequently as you need to to stay productive. No external tool or organizing format is going to be perfect for sorting both horizontally across and vertically down through all your projects. You'll still have to be aware of the whole in some cohesive way, such as via your weekly review. If you make the large project your one listing on your projects list, you'll want to keep a list of the sub-projects and or the project plan itself as project support material to be reviewed when you come to that major item. I would recommend doing it this way if big pieces of the project are dependent on other pieces getting done first. In that scenario, you might have sub-projects with no next actions attached to them because they are, in a sense, waiting for other things to happen before they can move forward. For instance, you might not be able to start on Renovate Kitchen until you finish Rewire Basement. However, you might be able to proceed on finalized landscaping independent of either of the other sub-projects. You would therefore want a next action to be continually current on rewire basement and finalized landscaping. Don't be too concerned about which way is best. If you're not sure, I'd vote for putting your big projects on the projects list and holding the sub-pieces in your project support material, making sure to include them in your weekly review. If that arrangement doesn't feel quite right, try including the active and independent sub-projects as separate entries on your master list. There's no perfect system for tracking all your projects and sub-projects the same way. You just need to know you have projects, and if they have associated components, where to find the appropriate reminders for them. Project Support Materials Project Support Materials are not project actions, and they're not project reminders. They're resources to support your actions and thinking about your projects. Don't use support material for reminding. Typically, people use stacks of papers and thickly stuffed file folders as reminders that, one, they've got a project, and two, they've got to do something about it. They're essentially making support materials serve as action reminders. The problem is that next actions and waiting for items on these projects have usually not been determined and are psychologically still embedded in the stacks and the folders, giving them the aura of just more stuff that repels its unorganizer instead of attracting him or her to action. When you're on the run in the heat of the activities of the day, files like that are the last thing you'll want to pick up and peruse for actions. You'll actually go numb to the files and the piles because they don't prompt you to do anything and they simply create more anxiety. If you're in this kind of situation, you must first 
add the project itself to your projects list as a reminder that there's an outcome to be achieved. Then the action steps and waiting for items must be put onto their appropriate action reminder lists. Finally, when it's time to actually do an action, like making a call to someone about the project, you can pull out all the materials you think you might need to have as support during the conversation. To reiterate, you don't want to use support materials as your primary reminders of what to do. That should be relegated to your action lists. If, however, the materials contain project plans and overviews, in addition to ad hoc, archival, and reference information, you may want to keep them a little more visibly accessible than you do the pure reference materials in your filing cabinet. The latter place is fine for support stuff, too, as long as you have the discipline to pull out the file drawer and take a look at the plan every time you do your weekly review. If not, you're better off storing those kinds of project support files in a standing file holder or a separate pending stack basket on your desk or credenza. To return to the previous example of moving into a new house, you could have a folder labeled New House containing all the plans and details and notes about the landscaping and the kitchen and the basement. In your weekly review, when you came to finish new house renovations on your project list, you'd pull out the new house file and thumb through all your notes to ensure that you weren't missing any possible next actions. Those actions would then get done, delegated, or deferred onto your action list, and the folder would be refiled until you needed it again for doing the actions or for your next weekly review. Many people who interact with prospects and clients have attempted to use client folders and or contact management software such as ACT to manage the account. The problem here is that some material is just facts or historical data that needs to be stored as background for when you might be able to use it, and some of what must be tracked is the actions required to move the relationships forward. The latter can be more effectively organized within your action list system. Client information is just that and it can be folded into a general reference file on the client or stored within a client-focused library. I use ACT for the single great feature it offers of allowing me to cross-reference general company information and significant interactions with key people within the company. It's just a good client-centered database. If I need to call a client, I don't want that reminder embedded anywhere but on my calls list. Organizing ad hoc project thinking. In Chapter 3, I suggested that you will often have ideas that you'll want to keep about projects, but that are not necessarily next actions. Those ideas fall into the broad category of project support materials, and may be anything from a notion about something you might want to do on your next vacation to a clarification of some major components in a project plan. These thoughts could come as you're driving down the freeway listening to a news story on the radio or reading a relevant article. What do you do with that kind of material? My recommendation here is that you consider where you're keeping tabs on the project or topic itself, how you might add information to it in that format, and where you might store any more extensive data associated with it. Most professionals will have several options for how to handle support materials, including attaching notes to a list item, organizing digital information in email and or databases, and maintaining paper-based files and notes in notebooks. Attached Notes Most organizing software allows you to attach a digital note to a list or calendar entry. If you're keeping a projects list within the software, you can go to the project you had a thought about, open or attach a note to it, and type in your idea. This is an excellent way to capture back-of-the-envelope project thinking. If your projects list is paper-based, you can attach a post-it note next to the item on your master list, or, if you're a low-tech type, on the item's separate sheet. In any case, you'll need to remember to look at the attachment when you review your project to make use of the data. Email and databases. Emails that might contain good information related to your projects can be held in a dedicated email folder. Just follow the previous instructions for at action and call it something like at projects. You may also find it worthwhile, if you don't have one already, to set up a more rigorous kind of digital database for organizing your thinking on a project or topic. If your company uses Lotus Notes, for example, you can create a project database either for your own private use on your PC or to be shared with others in your network. It's worth looking into some of the other types of freeform databases that are on the market too, even just for your own use. 
It's great to be able to cut and paste from the web or from emails and drop data under a topic somewhere or type in your own thoughts. Be sure also to explore the technology and tools that you already have. Just learning how to use all the lists and attachments in something like the Palm Organizer may provide you with sufficient back-of-the-envelope capability. Paper-based files. Having a separate file folder devoted to each project makes a lot of sense when you're accumulating paper-based materials. It may be low-tech, but it's an elegant solution nonetheless. Simplicity and ease of handling make for a good general reference filing system, one that lets you feel comfortable about creating a folder for scraps of paper from a meeting. Pages and notebooks. A great advantage of paper-based loose-leaf notebooks is that you can dedicate a whole page or group of pages to an individual project. For years, I maintained a mid-sized notebook with a projects list in front and a project support section toward the back, where I always had some blank pages to capture any random thinking or plans and details about projects on my list. Each of the methods described above can be effective in organizing project thinking. The key is that you must consistently look for any action steps inherent in your project notes and review the notes themselves as often as you think is necessary, given the nature of the project. You'll also want to clear out many of your notes once they become inactive or unreal to keep the whole system from catching the stale virus. I've found a lot of value in capturing these types of thoughts more for the way it consistently helps my thinking process than because I end up using every idea. Most I don't. But I try to make sure not to let my old thoughts stay around too long, pretending they're useful when they're not. Organizing non-actionable data. Interestingly, one of the biggest problems with most people's personal management systems is that they blend a few actionable things with a large amount of data and material that has value but no action attached. Having good, consistent structures with which to manage the non-actionable items in our work and lives is as important as managing our action and project reminders. When the non-actionable items aren't properly managed, they clog up the whole process. Unactionable items fall into two large categories, reference materials and reminders of things that need no action now but might at a later date. Reference materials. Much of what comes across your desk and into your life, in general, is reference material. There's no action required, but it's information you want to keep, for a variety of reasons. Your major decisions will be how much to keep, how much room to dedicate to it, what form it should be stored in, and where. Much of that will be a personal or organizational judgment call based upon legal or logistical concerns or personal preferences. The only time you should have attention on your reference material is when you need to change your system in some way because you have too much or too little information given your needs or preferences. The problem most people have psychologically with all their stuff is that it's still stuff. That is, they haven't decided what's actionable and what's not. Once you've made a clean distinction about which is which, what's left as reference should have no pull or incompletion associated with it. It's just your library. Your only decision, then, is how big a library you want. When you've fully implemented this action management methodology, you can be as big a pack rat as your space, physical and digital, will allow. As I've increased the size of the hard disk on my computer, I've kept that much more email in my archives. The more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned, since increasing the volume of pure reference material adds no psychic weight. The Variety of Reference Systems there are a number of ways to organize reference material and many types of tools to use. What follows is a brief discussion of some of the most common. General reference filing, paper and email. Large category filing. Rolodexes and contact managers. Libraries and archives. General reference filing. As I've said, a good filing system is critical for processing and organizing your stuff. It's also a must for dealing with the sometimes huge volume of paper-based materials that are valuable for you for one reason or another. Ideally, you will already have set up a general reference filing system as you were processing in. You need to feel comfortable storing even a single piece of paper that you might want to refer to later, and your system must be informal and accessible enough that it's a snap to file it away in your alphabetized general reference system, 
right at hand where you work. If you're not set up that way yet, review Chapter 4 for help on this topic. Most people seem to wind up with 200 to 400 paper-based general reference files and 30 to 100 email reference folders. Large Category Filing Any topic that requires more than 50 file folders should probably be given its own section or drawer with its own alpha-sorted system. For instance, if you're managing a corporate merger and need to keep hold of a lot of the paperwork, you may want to dedicate two or three whole file cabinets to all the documentation required in the due diligence process. If gardening or sailing or cooking is your passion, you may need at least a whole file drawer for those designated hobbies. Bear in mind that if your area of focus has support material that could blend into other areas of focus, you may run into the dilemma of whether to store the information in general reference or in the specialized reference files. When you read a great article about wood fencing and want to keep it, does that go in your garden cabinet or in the general reference system with other information about home-related projects? As a general rule, it's best to stick with one general reference system except for a very limited number of discrete topics. Rolodexes and Contact Managers Much of the information that you need to keep is directly related to people in your network. You need to track contact information of all sorts, home and office phone numbers and addresses, cell phone numbers, fax numbers, email addresses, and so on. In addition, if you find it useful, you may want to maintain information about birthdays, names of friends and colleagues, family members, hobbies, favorite wines and foods, and the like. In a more rigorous professional vein, you may need or want to track hire dates, performance review dates, goals and objectives, and other potentially relevant data for staff development purposes. The telephone address section of most of the organizers sold in the last 50 years is probably, along with the calendar, their most commonly used component. Everyone needs to keep track of phone numbers. It's instructive to note that this is purely and simply reference material. No action is required. This is just information that you might need to access in the future. So, there's no big mystery about how to organize it, aside from the logistics for your individual needs. Again, the only problem comes up when people try to make their Rolodexes serve as tools for reminding them about things they need to do. That doesn't work. As long as all the actions relative to people you know have been identified and tracked in your action reminder lists, there's no role for telephone and address systems to fill other than being a neutral address book. The only issue then becomes how much information you need to keep and where and in what equipment you need to keep it in order to have it accessible when you want it. Nothing's perfect in that regard, but as the small digital tools become easier to use and connect to larger databases, you'll be able to have more information at hand with the same or less effort. Libraries and Archives Personalized Levels Information that might be useful lives at many levels. You could probably find out pretty much anything if you were willing to dig deep enough. The question of how much to keep, how close, and in what form will be a changing reality, given the variables of your needs and your particular comfort levels with data. Relative to your personal organization and productivity, this is not a core issue, so long as all of your projects and actions are in a control system that you work with regularly. Reference material, in all its forms, then becomes nothing more or less than material to capture and create access to according to your particular proclivities and requirements. Some degree of consistency will always make things easier. What kinds of things do you need with you all the time? Those must go into your ubiquitous planner or PDA. What do you need specifically for meetings or off-site events? That should be put into your briefcase, pack, satchel, or purse. What might you need when you're working in your office? That should be put into your personal filing system or your networked computer. What about rare situations relative to your job? Material needed for those could be archived in departmental files or off-site storage. What could you find anytime you might need it on the web? You don't need to do anything with that information unless you need it when you're away from a web connection, in which case you should print the data out when you're online and store it in a file you can take with you. Do you see how that personal organization of reference material is simply a logistical issue? Distinguishing actionable things from non-actionable ones is the key success factor in this arena. Once you've done that, 
you have total freedom to manage and organize as much or little reference material as you want. It's a highly individual decision that ought to be based on the ratio of the value received to the time and effort required to capture and maintain it. Someday Maybes The last thing to deal with in your organization system is how to track things that you may want to reassess in the future. These could range from a special trip you might want to take one day, to books you might want to read, to projects you might want to tackle in the next fiscal year, to skills and talents you might want to develop. For a full implementation of this model, you'll need some sort of back burner or on hold component. There are several ways to stage things for later review, all of which will work to get them off your current radar on your mind. You can put the items on various versions of someday maybe lists, or trigger them on your calendar or in a paper based tickler system. Someday maybe list. It's highly likely that if you did a complete mind sweep when you were collecting things out of your psychic RAM, you came up with some things you're not sure you want to commit to. Learn Spanish, get Marcy a horse, climb Mount Washington, and build a guest cottage are typical projects that fall into this category. If you haven't already done it, I recommend that you create a someday maybe list in whatever organizing system you've chosen. Then give yourself permission to populate that list with all the items of that type that have occurred to you so far. You'll probably discover that simply having the list and starting to fill it out will cause you to come up with all kinds of creative ideas. You may also be surprised to find that some of the things you write on the list will actually come to pass almost without your making any conscious effort to make them happen. If you acknowledge the power of the imagination to foster changes in perception and performance, it's easy to see how having a someday maybe list out in front of your conscious mind could potentially add many wonderful adventures to your life and work. We're likely to seize opportunities when they arise if we've already identified and captured them as a possibility. That has certainly been my own experience. Learning to play the flute and how to sail big boats both started in this category for me. In addition to your in-basket, there are two rich sources to tap for your someday maybe list, your creative imagination and your list of current projects. Make an inventory of your creative imaginings. What are the things you really might want to do someday if you have the time, money, and inclination? Write them on your someday maybe list. Typical categories include things to get or build for your home, hobbies to take up, skills to learn, creative expressions to explore, clothes and accessories to buy, toys or gear to acquire, trips to take, organizations to join, service projects to contribute to, things to see and do. Reassess your current projects. Now is a good time to review your projects list from a more elevated perspective, that is, the standpoint of your job and goals, and consider whether you might transfer some of your current commitments to someday maybe. If, on reflection, you realize that an optional project doesn't have a chance of getting your attention for the next few months or more, move it to this list. Special categories of someday maybe. More than likely, you have some special interests that involve lots of possible things to do. It can be fun to collect these on lists. For instance, food, recipes, menus, restaurants, wines, children, things to do with them, books to read, CDs to buy, videos to buy or rent, cultural events to attend, gift ideas, garden ideas, websites to surf, weekend trips to take, meeting ideas, party ideas, ideas miscellaneous meaning you don't know where else to put them. These kinds of lists can be a cross between reference and someday maybe. Reference because you can just collect and add to lists of good wines or restaurants or books to consult as you like. Someday maybe because you might want to review the listed items on a regular basis to remind yourself to try one or more of them at some point. In any case, this is another great reason to have an organizing system that makes it easy to capture things that may add value and variety and interest to your life without clogging your mind and workspace with undecided, unfinished business.
the danger of hold and review files and piles. Many people have created some sort of hold and review pile or file or hold drawer that vaguely fits within the category of someday maybe. They tell themselves, when I have time, I may like to get to this, and a hold and review file seems a convenient place to put it. I personally don't recommend this particular kind of subsystem because in virtually every case I've come across, the client held but didn't review, and there was numbness and resistance about the stack. The value of someday maybe disappears if you don't put your conscious awareness back on it with some consistency. Also, there's a big difference between something that's managed well as a someday maybe list and something that's just a catch-all bucket for stuff. Usually much of that stuff needs to be tossed, some of it needs to go into read and review, some needs to be filed as reference, some belongs on the calendar or in a tickler file for review in a month or perhaps at the beginning of the next quarter, and some actually has next actions on it. Many times, after appropriately processing someone's hold and review drawer or file, I've discovered there was nothing left in it. Using the calendar for future options. Your calendar can be a very handy place to park reminders of things you might want to consider doing in the future. Most of the people I've coached were not nearly as comfortable with their calendars as they could have been, otherwise they probably would have found many more things to put in there. One of the three uses of a calendar is for day-specific information. This category can include a number of things, but one of the most creative ways to utilize this function is to enter things that you want to take off your mind and reassess at some later date. Here are a few of the myriad things you should consider inserting. Triggers for activating projects. Events you might want to participate in. Decision catalysts. Triggers for activating projects. If you have a project that you don't really need to think about now, but that deserves a flag at some point in the future, you can pick an appropriate date and put a reminder about the project in your calendar for that day. It should go in some day-specific versus time-specific calendar slot for the things you want to be reminded of on that day. Then, when the day arrives, you see the reminder and insert the item as an active project on your projects list. Typical candidates for this treatment are special events with a certain lead time for handling, like product launches, fundraising drives, etc. Regular events that you need to prepare for, such as budget reviews, annual conferences, planning events, or meetings. For example, when should you add next year's annual sales conference to your projects list? Key dates for significant people that you might want to do something about birthdays, anniversaries, holiday gift giving, etc. Events you might want to participate in. You probably get notices constantly about seminars, conferences, speeches, and social and cultural events that you may want to decide about attending as the time gets closer. So figure out when that closer time is and put a trigger in your calendar on the appropriate date. For example, Chamber of Commerce breakfast tomorrow? Tiger's season tickets go on sale today. PBS special on Australia tonight, 8 o'clock p.m. Church barbecue next Saturday. If you can think of any jogs like these that you'd like to put into your system, do it right now. Decision catalysts. Once in a while, there may be a significant decision that you need to make but can't or don't want to make right away. That's fine as long as you've concluded that the additional information you need has to come from an internal rather than an external source. For example, you need to sleep on it. Obviously, external data you need in order to make a decision should go on your next actions or waiting for lists. But in order to move to a level of okayness about not deciding, you'd better put out a safety net that you can trust to get you to focus on the issue appropriately in the future. A calendar reminder can serve that purpose. Some typical decision areas in this category include hire, fire, merge, acquire, sell, divest, change job or career. This is a big topic to devote so little space to, I know, but go ahead and ask yourself, is there any major decision for which I should create a future trigger so I can feel comfortable just hanging out with it for now? If there is, put some reminder in your calendar to revisit the issue. The Tickler File One elegant way to manage non-actionable items that may need an action in the future is the Tickler File. 
a three-dimensional version of a calendar. It allows you to hold physical reminders of things that you want to see or remember, not now, but in the future. It can be an extremely functional tool, allowing you to, in effect, set up your own post office and mail things to yourself for receipt on a designated future date. I myself have used a Tickler file for years and can't imagine being without it. Essentially, the Tickler is a simple file folder system that allows you to distribute paper and other physical reminders in such a way that whatever you want to see on a particular date in the future automatically shows up that day in your in-basket. If you have a secretary or assistant, you can entrust at least a part of this task to him or her, assuming that he or she has some working version of this or a similar system. Typical examples would be, hand me this agenda the morning of the day I have the meeting, or give this back to me on Monday to rethink since it applies to a meeting on Wednesday, or remind me about the Hong Kong trip two weeks ahead and we'll plan the logistics. Then every day of the week, that day's folder is pulled and reviewed. While you can and probably should utilize staff to handle as much of this as is appropriate, I recommend that if you can integrate it into your lifestyle, you maintain your own Tickler file. There are many useful functions it can perform, at least some of which you may want to avail yourself of outside the pale of your assistant's responsibilities. I use my Tickler file to manage my travel tickets and confirmations, paper-based travel directions, agendas and maps, reminders of event notifications that come in the mail, information about might want to buy kinds of things I want to reconsider in the future, and so forth. Bottom line, the Tickler file demands only a one second per day new behavior to make it work, and it has a payoff value logarithmically greater than the personal investment. Setting up a Tickler file. You need 43 folders, 31 daily files labeled 1 through 31, and 12 more labeled with the names of the months of the year. The daily files are kept in front, beginning with the file for tomorrow's date. If today is October 5th, then the first file would be number 6. The succeeding daily files represent the days of the rest of the month, 6 through 31. Behind the 31 file is the monthly file for the next month, November, and behind that are the daily files 1 through 5. Following that are the rest of the monthly files, December through October. The next daily file is emptied into your in-basket every day, and then the folder is refiled at the back of the dailies, at which point, instead of October 6, it represents November 6. In the same way, when the next monthly file reaches the front, it's emptied into the in-basket and refiled at the back of the monthlies to represent November a year from now. On October 31st, in other words, after you empty the daily file, the November file will be the next one, with the daily files 1 through 31 behind it. This is a perpetual file, meaning that at any given time it contains files for the next 31 days and the next 12 months. You can refer to the PDF file included with this program for a Tickler file example diagram. The big advantage of using file folders for your Tickler system is that they allow you to store actual documents the form that needs to be filled out on a certain day, the memo that needs to be reviewed then, the telephone note that needs action on a specific date, etc. In order for the system to work, you must update it every day. If you forget to empty the daily file, you won't trust the system to handle important data, and you'll have to manage those things some other way. If you leave town or don't access the file on the weekend, you must be sure to check the folders for the days you'll be away before you go. Checklists. Creative Reminders. The last topic in personal system organization that deserves some attention is the care and feeding of checklists, those recipes of potential ingredients for projects, events, and areas of value, interest, and responsibility. The most creative checklists are often generated at the back end of a good consulting process with a team or company. Good ones also show up as areas of focus for training staff or hiring into new job slots. When I'm clearing in-baskets with clients and reviewing other things they're concerned about, we often run across little memos to self like exercise more regularly, make sure we have evaluation forms for each training, spend more quality time with my kids, do more proactive planning for the division, maintain good morale with my team, ensure we are in alignment with corporate strategy, keep the client billing process up to date. What should you do with these fuzzier kinds of internal commitments and areas of attention? 
First, clarify inherent projects and actions. For much of this kind of stuff, there is still a project and or an action that needs to be defined. Exercise more regularly really translates for many people into set up regular exercise program, a project, and call Sally for suggestions about personal trainers, a real action step. In such cases, inherent projects and actions still need to be clarified and organized into a personal system. But there are some things that don't quite fit into that category. Blueprinting key areas of work and responsibility. Objectives like maintain good physical conditioning or physical health and vitality may still need to be built into some sort of overview checklist that will be reviewed regularly. You have multiple layers of outcomes and standards playing on your psyche and your choices at any point in time, and knowing what those are at all the different levels is always a good idea. I suggested earlier that there are at least six levels of your work that could be defined, and that each level deserves its own acknowledgement and evaluation. A complete inventory of everything you hold important and are committed to on each of those levels would represent an awesome checklist. It might include career goals, service, family, relationships, community, health and energy, financial resources, creative expression. And then moving down a level within your job, you might want some reminders of your key areas of responsibility, your staff, your values, and so on. A list of these might contain points like team morale, processes, timelines, staff issues, workload, communication. All of these items could in turn be included on the list in your personal system as reminders to you, as needed, to keep the ship on course on an even keel. The more novel the situation, the more control is required. The degree to which any of us needs to maintain checklists and external controls is directly related to our unfamiliarity with the area of responsibility. If you've been doing what you're doing for a long time, and there's no pressure on you to change in that area, you probably need minimal external personal organization to stay on cruise control. You know when things must happen and how to make them happen, and your system is fine, status quo. Often, though, that's not the case. Many times you'll want some sort of checklist to help you maintain a focus until you're more familiar with what you're doing. If your CEO suddenly disappeared, for example, and you had instantly to fill his shoes, you'd need some overviews and outlines in front of you for a while to ensure that you had all the mission-critical aspects of the job handled. And if you've just been hired into a new position with new responsibilities that are relatively unfamiliar to you, you'll want a framework of control and structure, if only for the first few months. There have been times when I needed to make a list of areas that I had to handle temporarily until things were under control. For instance, when my wife and I decided to create a brand new structure for a business we'd been involved with for many years, I took on areas of responsibility I'd never had to deal with before, namely accounting, computers, marketing, legal, and administration. For several months, I needed to keep a checklist of those responsibilities in front of me to ensure that I filled in the blanks everywhere and managed the transition as well as I could. After the business got onto cruise control to some degree, I no longer needed that list. Checklists at all levels. Be open to creating any kind of checklist as the urge strikes you. The possibilities are endless, from core life values to things to take camping. Making lists ad hoc as they occur to you is one of the most powerful yet subtlest and simplest procedures that you can install in your life. To spark your creative thinking, here's a list of some of the topics of checklists I have seen and used over the years. Personal affirmations, that is, personal value statements. Job areas of responsibility, such as key responsibility areas. Travel checklist, everything to take on or do before a trip. Weekly review, everything to review and or update on a weekly basis. Training program components, all the things to handle when putting on an event front to back. Clients. Conference checklist, everything to handle when putting on a conference. Focus areas, key life roles and responsibilities. Key people in my life or work, 
relationships to assess regularly for completion and opportunity development. Organization chart, key people and areas of output to manage and maintain. Personal development, things to evaluate regularly to ensure personal balance and progress. Get comfortable with checklists, both ad hoc and more permanent. Be ready to create and eliminate them as required. Appropriately used, they can be a tremendous asset in personal productivity. If, in fact, you have now collected everything that represents an open loop in your life and work, process each one of those items in terms of what it means to you and what actions are required, and organize the results into a complete system that holds a current and complete overview, large and small, of all your present and someday projects, then you're ready for the next phase of implementation in the art of stress-free productivity, the review process. Chapter 8. Reviewing. Keeping your system functional. The purpose of this whole method of workflow management is not to let your brain become lax, but rather to enable it to move toward more elegant and productive activity. In order to earn that freedom, however, your brain must engage on some consistent basis with all your commitments and activities. You must be assured that you're doing what you need to be doing and that it's okay to be not doing what you're not doing. Reviewing your system on a regular basis and keeping it current and functional are prerequisites for that kind of control. If you have a list of calls you must make, for example, the minute that list is not totally current with all the calls you need to make, your brain will not trust the system, and it won't get relief from its lower-level mental tasks. It will have to take back the job of remembering, processing, and reminding, which, as you should know by now, it doesn't do very effectively. All of this means your system cannot be static. In order to support appropriate action choices, it must be kept up to date, and it should trigger consistent and appropriate evaluation of your life and work at several horizons. There are two major issues that need to be handled at this point. What do you look at in all this and when? What do you need to do and how often to ensure that all of it works as a consistent system, freeing you up to think and manage at a higher level? A real review process will lead to enhanced and proactive new thinking in key areas of your life and work. Such thinking emerges from both focused concentration and serendipitous brainstorming which will be triggered and galvanized by a consistent personal review of your inventory of actions and projects. What to look at when. Your personal system and behaviors need to be established in such a way that you can see all the action options you need to see when you need to see them. This is really just common sense, but few people actually have their processes and their organization honed to the point where they are as functional as they could be. When you have access to a phone and any discretionary time, you ought to at least glance at the list of all the phone calls you need to make and then either direct yourself to the best one to handle or give yourself permission to feel okay about not bothering with any of them. When you're about to go in for a discussion with your boss or your partner, take a moment to review the outstanding agendas you have with him or her so you'll know that you're using your time most effectively. When you need to pick up something at the dry cleaners, first quickly review all the other errands that you might be able to do en route. People often ask me, how much time do you spend looking at your system? My answer is simply, as much time as I need to feel comfortable about what I'm doing. In actuality, it's an accumulation of two seconds here, three seconds there. What most people don't realize is that my lists are in one sense my office. Just as you might have post-its and stacks of phone slips at your workstation, so do I on my next actions list. Assuming that you've completely collected, processed, and organized your stuff, you'll most likely take only a few brief moments here and there to access your system for day-to-day -day reminders. Looking at your calendar first. Your most frequent review will probably be of your daily calendar and your daily tickler folder, if you're maintaining one, to see the hard landscape and assess what has to get done. You need to know the time and space parameters first. Knowing that you have wall-to-wall -wall meetings from 8 a.m. through 6 p.m., for example, with barely a half-hour break for lunch, will help you make necessary decisions about any other activities. Then your action list. After you review all your day and time-specific commitments and handle whatever you need to about them, 
your next most frequent area for review will be the list of all the actions you could possibly do in your current context. If you're in your office, for instance, you'll look at your list of calls, computer actions, and in-office things to do. This doesn't necessarily mean you will actually be doing anything on those lists. You'll just evaluate them against the flow of other work coming at you to ensure that you make the best choices about what to deal with. You need to feel confident that you're not missing anything critical. Frankly, if your calendar is trustworthy and your action lists are current, they may be the only things in the system you'll need to refer to more than every couple of days. There have been many days when I didn't need to look at any of my lists, in fact, because it was clear from the front end, my calendar, what I wouldn't be able to do. The right review in the right context. You may need to access any one of your lists at any time. When you and your spouse are decompressing at the end of the day, and you want to be sure you'll take care of the business the two of you manage together about home and family, you'll want to look at your accumulated agendas for him or her. On the other hand, if your boss pops in for a face-to-face -face conversation about current realities and priorities, it will be highly functional for you to have your projects list up to date and your agenda list for him or her right at hand. Updating your system. The real trick to ensuring the trustworthiness of the whole organization system lies in regularly refreshing your psyche and your system from a more elevated perspective. That's impossible to do, however, if your lists fall too far behind your reality. You won't be able to fool yourself about this. If your system is out of date, your brain will be forced to fully engage again at the lower level of remembering. This is perhaps the biggest challenge of all. Once you've tasted what it's like to have a clear head and feel in control of everything that's going on, can you do what you need to do to maintain that as an operational standard? The many years I spent researching and implementing this methodology with countless people have proved to me that the magic key to the sustainability of the process is the weekly review. The power of the weekly review. If you're like me and most other people, no matter how good your intentions may be, you're going to have the world come at you faster than you can keep up. Many of us seem to have it in our natures consistently to entangle ourselves in more than we have the ability to handle. We book ourselves back to back in meetings all day, go to after hours events that generate ideas and commitments we need to deal with, and get embroiled in engagements and projects that have the potential to spin our creative intelligence into cosmic orbits. That whirlwind of activity is precisely what makes the weekly review so valuable. It builds in some capturing, reevaluation, and reprocessing time to keep you in balance. There is simply no way to do this necessary regrouping while you're trying to get everyday work done. The weekly review will also sharpen your intuitive focus on your important projects as you deal with the flood of new input and potential distractions coming at you the rest of the week. You're going to have to learn to say no faster and to more things, in order to stay afloat and comfortable. Having some dedicated time in which to at least get up to the project level of thinking goes a long way toward making that easier. What is the weekly review? Very simply, the weekly review is whatever you need to do to get your head empty again. It's going through the five phases of workflow management, collecting, processing, organizing, and reviewing all your outstanding involvements until you can honestly say, I absolutely know right now everything I'm not doing but could be doing if I decided to. From a nitty-gritty, practical standpoint, here is the drill that can get you there. Loose papers. Pull out all miscellaneous scraps of paper, business cards, receipts, and so on that have crept into the crevices of your desk, clothing, and accessories. Put it all into your in-basket for processing. Process your notes. Review any journal entries, meeting notes, or miscellaneous notes scribbled on notebook paper. List action items, projects, waiting fors, calendar events, and someday maybes, as appropriate. File any reference notes and materials. Stage your read-review material. Be ruthless with yourself, processing all notes and thoughts relative to interactions, projects, new initiatives, and input that have come your way since your last download, and purging those not needed. Previous calendar data. Review past calendar dates in detail for remaining action items, reference information, and so on, 
and transfer that data into the active system. Be able to archive your last week's calendar with nothing left uncaptured. Upcoming calendar. Look at future calendar events, long and short term. Capture actions about arrangements and preparations for any upcoming events. Empty your head. Put in writing, in appropriate categories, any new projects, action items, waiting fors, someday maybes, and so forth that you haven't yet captured. Review projects and larger outcome lists. Evaluate the status of projects, goals, and outcomes one by one, ensuring that at least one current Kickstart action for each is in your system. Review next actions lists. Mark off completed actions. Review for reminders of further action steps to capture. Review waiting for list. Record appropriate actions for any needed follow-up. Check off received items. Review any relevant checklist. Is there anything you haven't done that you need to do? Review someday maybe list. Check for any projects that may have become active and transfer them to projects. Delete items no longer of interest. Review pending and support files. Browse through all work in progress support material to trigger new actions, completions, and waiting fors. Be creative and courageous. Are there any new, wonderful, harebrained, creative, thought-provoking, risk-taking ideas you can add to your system? This review process is common sense, but few of us do it as well as we could, and that means as regularly as we should to keep a clear mind and a sense of relaxed control. The right time and place for the review. The weekly review is so critical that it behooves you to establish good habits, environments, and tools to support it. Once your comfort zone has been established for the kind of relaxed control that getting things done is all about, you won't have to worry too much about making yourself do the review. You'll have to do it to get back to your personal standards again. Until then, do whatever you need to once a week to trick yourself into backing away from the daily grind for at least a couple of hours, not to zone out but to rise up at least to 10,000 feet and catch up. If you have the luxury of an office or workspace that can be somewhat isolated from the people and interactions of the day, and if you have anything resembling a typical Monday to Friday work week, I recommend that you block out two hours early every Friday afternoon for the review. Three factors make this an ideal time. First, the events of the week are likely to be still fresh enough for you to be able to do a complete post-mortem. Oh, yeah, I need to make sure I get back to her about, and so forth. Second, when you invariably uncover actions that require reaching people at work, you'll still have time to do that before they leave for the weekend. And third, it's great to clear your psychic decks so you can go into the weekend ready for refreshment and recreation with nothing on your mind. You may be the kind of person, however, who doesn't have normal weekends. I, for example, often have as much to do on Saturday and Sunday as on Wednesday. But I do have the questionable luxury of frequent long plane trips, which provide an ideal opportunity for me to catch up. A good friend and client of mine, an executive in the world's largest aerospace company, has his own Sunday night ritual of relaxing in his home office and processing the hundreds of notes he's generated during his week of back-to-back -back meetings. Whatever your lifestyle, you need a weekly regrouping ritual. You likely have something like this or close to it already. If so, leverage the habit by adding into it a higher altitude review process. The people who find it hardest to make time for this review are those who have constantly on-demand work and home environments with zero built-in time or space for regrouping. The most stressed professionals I have met are the ones who have to be mission-critically reactive at work for example, high-level equities traders and chiefs of staff, and then go home to a couple of under-10-year-old children and a spouse who also works. The most fortunate of them have a one-hour train commute. If you recognize yourself in that picture, your greatest challenge will be to build in a consistent process of regrouping when your world is not directly in your face. You'll need to either accept the requirement of an after-hours time at your desk on a Friday night 
or establish a relaxed but at work kind of location and time at home. Executive Operational Review Time I've coached many executives to block out two hours on their calendars on Fridays. For them, the biggest problem is how to balance quality thinking and catch-up time with the urgent demands of mission-critical interactions. This is a tough call. The most senior and savvy of them, however, know the value of sacrificing the seemingly urgent for the truly important, and they create their islands of time for some version of this process. Even the executives who have integrated a consistent reflective time in their work, though, often seem to give short shrift to the more mundane review and catch-up process at the 10,000-foot level. Between wall-to-wall -wall meetings and ambling around your koi pond with a Chardonnay at sunset, there's got to be a slightly elevated level of reflection and regrouping required for operational control and focus. If you think you have all your open loops fully identified, clarified, assessed, and actionalized, you're probably kidding yourself. The Bigger Picture Reviews Yes, at some point, you must clarify the larger outcomes, the long-term goals, the visions and principles that ultimately drive and test your decisions. What are your key goals and objectives in your work? What should you have in place a year or three years from now? How is your career going? Is this the lifestyle that is most fulfilling to you? Are you doing what you really want or need to do from a deeper and longer-term perspective? The explicit focus of this book is not at those 30,000 to 50,000 plus foot levels. Urging you to operate from a higher perspective is, however, its implicit purpose, to assist you in making your total life expression more fulfilling and better aligned with the bigger game we're all about. As you increase the speed and agility with which you clear the runway and 10,000 foot levels of your life and work, be sure to revisit the other levels you're engaged in, now and then, to maintain a truly clear head. How often you ought to challenge yourself with that type of wide-ranging review is something only you can know. The principle I must affirm at this juncture is this. You need to assess your life and work at the appropriate horizons, making the appropriate decisions at the appropriate intervals in order to really come clean. Which brings us to the ultimate point and challenge of all this personal collecting, processing, organizing, and reviewing methodology. It's 9.22 a.m. Wednesday morning. What do you do?